five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, space enthusiasts. Our guest this episode is one of the best known entrepreneurs in new space. Peter Platzer, the founder and CEO of Spire. We cover a lot of ground in our conversation, including talking about commercial space in general and about Spire's new space as a service offering. Trust me, you don't want to miss this one. If you enjoy the podcast, a reminder to please leave us a review or rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple, so more people can find out about it. Thank you. Give you a couple of short messages from our sponsors, and then please enjoy my conversation with Peter. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out, and also check out my episode with the CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Space Business Podcast. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Peter Platzer, the CEO and founder of Spire. Welcome, Peter. It's my pleasure to be here. What a fun. I'm really looking forward to this. Me too. And you know what I'm especially excited about? This is the first in-person recording I'm doing since March 2020. I think they're, they're actually, we're somewhere in the mid-50s of the number of episodes of the Space Business Podcast. I think this is episode number 55 or something. I think there have only ever been three episodes live recorded or so, and then Corona hit. <laughs> Well, I'm honored to be one of those. Here we go. And we are here in uh, Spire's offices in, in, in Luxembourg. And we might as well start here. Luxembourg, I think a lot of people probably, a lot of listeners have heard about Luxembourg as an you know, emerging um, space nation and a really exciting ecosystem. Do you just want to give us a few minutes about your view being based in, in Luxembourg and your experience? Absolutely. Um, I met uh, the former Deputy Prime Minister, D.P.M. Schneider, in, mm. uh, uh, at a conference in NASA. It's now probably five or six years ago. And he really had a fantastic vision for Luxembourg in leveraging space to, to grow and, and diversify the economy. Because he recognized that Luxembourg has this great asset of being a country. And as you know, you know starting with the Outer Space Treaty and the uh, Earth Observation uh, Convention and the other international laws and the ITU, space law is really set up for an equitable use, mm -hmm. where being a country gives you the right to participate on a more or less equal footing. Mm -hmm. And so he really had this vision of bringing a lot of a space to Luxembourg, recognizing that there is a massive transformational wave going on in the space industry that some of the big banks in the U.S. project to be trillions of dollars of GDP in the next um, uh, 10 or 20 years. And we really got attracted by this commitment uh, from the country. And, you know, we moved here four years ago. Mm -hmm. It is now our second largest office. And, you know, I'm originally from Austria, so I feel incredibly at home here. Mm -hmm. And especially the uh, when you when you look at the international nature of it. I mean, everyone speaks a minimum of four or five languages. Yep. So you have a very, very international environment that makes it a very, very pleasant and interesting place to live. And I guess by now the ecosystem is so big with other prominent companies that people may know like iSpace and, and Redwire and so forth that there is really sort of, you're probably starting to have network effects, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you, you run into the people um, uh, uh, in, in, in conferences, but also for, for collaborations with, with, with customers and others. So it really has started to work given the size of number of companies that they have attracted. They have an investment fund here that is focused on space. They have a, a separate space agency set up that is very commercially focused. So it's it's really, I think, a quite productive environment. Yeah, and I must say, I, I love coming here as well. And I'm, I'm currently enrolled at the University of Luxembourg for doctoral studies as well. So I have a reason to come regularly. And lastly, the, the food and drinks are fantastic here. Yes. <laughs> so now that um, we've, I hope we've made our friends at the LSA and the Luxembourg government happy, let's talk about Spire a little bit and the space industry in general. Peter, 
a lot of, I think actually most people in the space sector obviously know you and know Spire. Now, one of our ambitions with the Space Business Podcast, though, was to always reach people who are not yet members of the space sector. So I'm going to ask you to give an introduction of yourself and Spire anyway, if you don't mind. Absolutely happy to. So I'm, I'm originally from Austria, a physicist that then worked on the business side um, in, in strategy consulting and then went to business school in the U.S., after which I spent nine years as an investment manager on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And then through an event on NASA Ames, came into contact with people like Peter Diamandis and Salim Ismail and Neil Jacobson and others, and, and recognized that finally space had reached that point of being on an exponential curve and being relevant to solve problems on Earth for everyday people. Now, I had been waiting of this literally for decades. I actually, at one point, wrote a mission statement for my life, which was to lead, inspire, and create the business of space for the benefit of all. But when I looked at it about once a decade, unfortunately, it was just too slow an industry. And so it was uh, then in, uh, in about 2010, I left uh, uh, my job and went back to, uh, to school uh, in Strasbourg and, and got my last credit degree in space science and did the piece of research there that started Spire. And Spire's sole business is to leverage space to solve problems on Earth. Mm -hmm. We use a, a, particularly, uh, a particular modality, um, radio frequencies, to observe activities in the Earth. So we, uh, we track the $17 trillion of global trade, Mm -hmm. uh, we track, track um, all of uh, uh, aviation activity. Uh, we track and predict the weather, which is impacting some 30, 40 trillion dollars of global GDP. And I would say argue 100 percent of the world population and sell our data and services as a subscription to uh, uh, commercial companies and uh, civil uh, agencies and, 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 and defense agencies. And we have about 500 or more customers as of today. Mm -hmm. So this was, uh, when was the NASA Ames conference that inspired you to do this all? So that was in 2009. Okay. And then in 2010, I left my job. I started um, uh, in Strasbourg in 2011, graduated in 2012, and started the company in September in the true proverbial garage in San Francisco. Understood. So 2009, that was, I mean, compared to where we are today, obviously still very early days for what we these days call new space. And you know, yes. we can argue about that expression, whether it makes sense or not, but let's, let's say it anyway. So I think, yeah, SpaceX had already flown, finally flown the Falcon 1 on the fourth attempt. Yeah. Um, they may have won all... I think they did their first financing round in 2008, but they were nowhere near where they are now. So that was still an aggressive bet to take. So let me ask you, what gave you the comfort to take that bet? And then how did you end up choosing Spire's business model when, of course, you could have chosen other space sectors as well. And as we know, of course, a lot of people got attracted to things like, like the launch business, right? And where you build rockets. It's very yeah. exciting. What made you choose? What was the process and the, think, the thinking you went through to come up with Spire? So the first thing that really helped me was that I lived through, not very actively, but you know, partially actively, but mostly by experience, through the transformation from mainframe computers to personal computers to the internet. Mm -hmm. So when I was at CERN, we had like this massive supercomputer at Cray between, you know, three layers of security. And, and today I carry a Cray that is like 10 times as powerful as the Cray 2 we had there in, in my pocket. Mm -hmm. I had built the early PCs. I had been at the conferences where people said, there is a world market for three computers. Mm -hmm. and, you know, no one mm -hmm. needs them at home. So I had seen what Moore's Law, what an exponential improvement in capability for a fixed price and size point does to an industry. And I just started to see exactly the same thing happening in the space industry, finally, which I had monitored for many, many years, you know, literally like a few decades at that point in time. And so that gave me then the confidence that, you know, here is something happening. And given that I had been passionate about it since I was a teenager, um, uh, there was just a merging of a passion for something that finally had come to a, um, the first inkling of an exponential stage. And then when I got my graduate degree in space science in France, I did a piece of research where I looked at all of the capabilities of all of these small satellite missions that had been done since 
since the invention of this new standard that they call a CubeSat. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was a very steady exponential improvement, 10x performance every five years, which is faster than Moore's Law. And when I talked with 100 experts from the space industry, 111 or so I interviewed, they all saw a very linear, slow progression of capability. And that was a classic disruption, Clayton Christensen um, uh, difference between an exponentially improving technology and the linear perception of the rest of the world. And that gave me the confidence, yes, here is um, uh, a business, here is a technology that is capable of really solving problems on earth that are relevant. Because I projected forward, what will the capabilities be in five years and in 10 years yeah. if I follow this 10x every five years curve? Yeah. And it was blindingly obvious that by 2015, by 2020, those devices will be highly capable solving real world problems. Yeah. And out of curiosity, when you were elaborating those statistics, the improvement statistics for yourself, how, how were you measuring performance? Was that looking at capabilities like you know spatial or other resolution, or how did you think about that? All of them, okay. right? So I literally read just about every single paper that I could find, right? I think there was something like 963 that had been published with the word CubeSat or NanoSat in it at that point in time. Uh, and I read almost every single one of them. And I looked at power. Mm. I looked at uh, pointing accuracy. I looked at at steering, I looked at compute, I looked at storage, I looked at um, antenna gain, I looked at bandwidth download, I looked at all of those metrics, and every single one of them was 10x every five years. Yeah. I think, I don't know if you agree, but I always think this is a really important point, what you're mentioning here, because I think for the wider public that's at least following the space industry to some extent, people are very mesmerized and at this point in time, knowledgeable about the cost degrees that has taken place uh, with regard to launch costs, right, that we have gone from... I don't know, let's, let's say that the space shuttle, like $25,000 or so dollars a kilogram on a, in a good year to sub $3,000 on a Falcon 9. But I personally think a lot of people are actually not aware about the cost decreases you are describing. Or the cost of performance improvements, cost decreases, whichever you want to look at it, right? And which I, which I think are equally, if not more important. I think, I think you're 100% correct, Rafael. I think it's actually one of the biggest misunderstandings at the current point in time of what is driving this revolution of leveraging space to solve problems on Earth. Um, The cost of launch has come down, no doubt. And if you take a really long view, you know, you just took a a 30-year view, um, it has come down in order of magnitude. If you take a 10-year view, if you take a a 15-year view, it has come down maybe by a factor of of like three, (laughs) maybe four, (laughs) right? Um, Which is impressive. However, there are two other things that completely dwarf that change. The first one is the capability improvement for a fixed price point, which over a period of 15 years is a thousandfold. Mm -hmm. And over a period of 20 years, it is Mm 10,000fold. So it's absolutely massive. It is truly Moore's law that is happening here. Mm -hmm. Now, the equally important other component here is not the cost of launch, but the availability of launch. Mm -hmm. The genius of Bob and Jordy was that they recognized When a rocket goes up, and again, not necessarily that widespread, there is a rocket going up somewhere on planet Earth every three days, roughly. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of rockets going up and have been going up for many, many decades. Mm -hmm. And they pick up big, massive payloads. Mm -hmm. But that big, massive payload is not perfectly matched to the thrust of the rocket. Mm -hmm. And so traditionally, you match that with some extra water and sand. And the genius idea of Jordi and uh, and Bob in 99 was, why don't we replace some of that sand and water with small satellites? Mm -hmm. And that was then creating the birth of secondary launch opportunities, Mm -hmm. which exploded access to launch. Mm-hmm. Spire has launched with 10 different launch providers. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done 30 different launch campaigns. And so the combination of a faster than Moore's law capability improvement and an exponential increase in access to space, those are the true drivers, even though they're not as sexy as seeing rockets going up and seeing that the price of a SpaceX launch keeps on coming down. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just um, as a side note for our listeners um, who, who may not know, Peter has mentioned uh, the name is Bob and Jordan here a few times and those are not sort of like common friends of uh, pals of me and Peter they're actually the, the co-inventors of the 
the CubeSat standard. The, the CubeSat, as, uh, as, as listeners may know, is basically the standard where you have a, a 10 cent, like a cube with a 10 centimeter side length. And um, it's uh, using basically, you can use an increasing number of standardized components to construct satellites. That actually brings up another sort of important trend, which I guess we have implicitly but not explicitly mentioned, right? Which is miniaturization. I think you you alluded to that when you're saying like, you know, the power of what used to be a Cray 2 supercomputer is now in our cell phones. But the same thing has happened with regard to satellite technology as well, right? And that, of course, is a nexus to then the, the launch cost decreases, right? Because it means that the same capability is going to be occupying a smaller space, probably has much lower mass, which means your launch cost is lower too, which means you have a double whammy effect. That is absolutely that is absolutely correct. Um, the the design criteria for satellites have a lot in common with the design criteria for consumer electronics, mm-hmm. UAV, robotics. And so we get to leverage the advancements that are happening there and adapt them for use in space. And miniaturization is one of those one of those big elements. Mm-hmm. And so maybe if we make this tangible, let's talk about your your own satellites. Um, I think I believe they're called the Lemur yep. satellites. How big are they? How much do they weigh? And sort of what kind of capabilities do they have? So our Lima, which is uh, uh, an, an acronym. Uh, not just for a very pretty and funny animal, but it stands for mm-hmm. low earth multi-use uh, receiver mm-hmm. is a satellite about the size of a bottle of wine, mm-hmm. um, five kilograms, six kilograms. Uh, and it has little wings, you know, we call them solar panels, but you mm-hmm. can think of them as, 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 as wings, so to yeah. speak. Um, uh, and it has multiple capabilities. That's the, you know, that's where the M stands for multi-use. Mm-hmm. It is tracking uh, ships, which carry, you know, 17 trillions of, uh, of global trade. Um, it tracks up planes, you know, um, uh, the aviation industry, and it collects highly crucial weather information. And again, to, to talk about the miniaturization here, um, those small satellites uh, today uh, produce in aggregate more data, for example, on the weather side than, than just as far as we know, the rest of the world combined, a particular type of weather data, GPSRO, um, because of that miniaturization um, effect and because of the, um, uh, the scale effect of doing something many Many, many, many times, mm-hmm. uh, we now have the world's largest RF sensing constellation in the world. And so um, that effect that you just mentioned beforehand really is driving that massive capability improvement here um, for, for, for the for the for the LIMO satellite. Mm-hmm. And you, so you said three kilograms? Uh, five. Five, 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 five kilograms. kilograms. But so I guess that means um, I believe sort of the current ride share cost or at least published ride share cost on SpaceX is five thousand dollars a kilogram. So it, it means one of those launches for about twenty five thousand dollars. Is that right? Um, I, I will have to, you know, you have to do your own math um, yeah. uh, here and then that genuinely I think there is a uh, 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 great differences if you buy, you know, a thousand kilograms sure. of something, yeah. or if you buy five kilograms of something, mm-hmm. and that applies to, you know, um, uh, uh, grocery supplies um, uh, yeah. just as well as as to launch. Because, but the point that you make here yeah. is an important one: the massive capacity of those big rockets to launch very large structures at uh, substantially lower cost than, for example, the space shuttle did, is really opening up um, the space economy to things like, you know, a, a base on the moon, mm-hmm. traveling to Mars, mm-hmm. um, uh, to uh, uh, to habitats hotels and research um, on orbit, manufacturing on orbit. So it really opens up the capability for the space economy to have much, much larger structures mm-hmm. because now it is actually becoming affordable to launch something off, you know, a ton, 10 tons, 100 tons, mm-hmm. because there are so many an increasing number of vehicles that are capable of launching larger masses and that is bringing down the cost together with the, all the ingenuity that those launch companies have, like reusability and building larger rockets and, and better launch pads. Mm-hmm. So certainly, and we'll, we shall talk about Starship uh, uh, in a few minutes for sure. Uh, but coming back, I think towards the beginning of the conversation, you, just, you said something along the lines of like, you know, you really wanted to put satellites in place to produce a lot of data, which can be helpful to us mm-hmm. on Earth. If you look not just at Spire, but sort of the industry at large and whatever you want to call it, the remote sensing industry, where are we in that process now? How far along the path are we? Are we are you not one percent? Okay. One percent. It's literally um the very, very early stages. I would 
I, I, I still continue to find the comparison to the, uh, the revolution of mainframes to personal computers and the internet a fantastic comparison than analog. And I've looked at some curves like the, the adoption of cell phones versus landlines. And the curve overlays, the steepness of this exponential curve is almost exactly the same as small satellites launched relative to large satellites launched. So there is a lot, a lot of similarities there. And I would still say we are in the, in the early 90s um, uh, uh, with regards to this evolution. And the real use of the internet to massively change our life didn't start until the early 2000s. Right. Yeah. Yes. That's when we really started having significant, let's call them apps that were running on yeah. top of the infrastructure. Let's maybe stay. I mean, if you think this is a sort of correct analogy, let's maybe stay with that sort of the infrastructure going towards apps. Right. And you were basically describing two elements of infrastructure, sort of big mainframes in a computer comparison going to personal computers. So we the big satellites going to sort of like smaller, small sets, cube sets. So if we start with the infrastructure layer, I mean, how close to being done, so to say, are we on the infrastructure layer? We have a number of um, EO constellations now. We have a number of optical um, optical constellations. We have a number of radar constellations. We're starting to have hyperspectral constellations. How far how far down the path are we on the infrastructure layer in your mind? So I would still argue that it's like you know in the one to five percent range, right? Um, uh, because what you the data you can capture from space to solve problems on Earth, it, it is still very very broad. Now, RF sometimes lives in between the world yeah. of EO mm -hmm. and communication. Mm -hmm. But just to give you, um, you know, one way to think about this in the in the 80s and even 90s, the concept that um, uh, well, not in the 90s, but in the 80s, that a company would have their own computer was pretty rare. Mm -hmm. If computers were something for governments and maybe the largest corporations mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. I think we are starting to move in that direction where the concept that a company has its own satellite constellation is becoming actually very doable. Mm -hmm. And so you, that's, where, that's where my 1% to 5% number is coming from that I could see in a in in a, in a in the future, more and more companies having their own satellites or satellite constellations, the same way they have their own computers um, uh, uh, coming out of that revolution from mainframe to personal computer. I think that's a super interesting point, um, and that brings up sort of the question on customer groups, and it's it's I guess one of the main, if not the main, potential growth avenue for remote sensing as well, where historically correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of it has been you know, national security related. But now in the recent past, we've actually seen a number of announcements um, you know, of commercial non-space companies coming in and talking about their own satellites, right? I mean, just off the top of my head, um, I think John Deere has talked about it or is talking about it, is doing actually something about it. Um, I think Axon and um, I think the most recent I've seen was um, was Rio Tinto, so from the mining sector. I think I think they're doing something with Pixel, which is a proposed hyperspectral um, constellation. Oh, and I guess then in the, in the realm of weather, we could also throw in Tomorrow IO, which uh, um, I, I guess started as a non-space company and is becoming a space company. But how do you see this process evolving? I mean, what I'm seeing still day to day is I would agree with you. Here we are really very early on, and part of the problem is that the non-space sectors are still not educated enough about absolutely the possibilities of space absolutely. but it's the same way as it was you know in in the 80s and in the 90s mm -hmm. um where the average person um did not know what the internet was or how to use it mm -hmm. and i'm uh, I, I read it somewhere i don't know if it was true but i read it somewhere that um uh, jeff bezos was talking about his idea of selling computers over the internet and someone asked him i don't understand how you're gonna get the book into the phone line <laughs> Right. I mean, so that concept of, of, of electronic communication driving a whole host of other things was just, 
it was just not widely spread. It was not widely understood. I, I remember a conference where there was a panel discussion about personal computers and, and the poor chap was asked, what's going to be the killer app for the personal computer? And it was so early, it was like the days of the 286 maybe, um, that the poor chap was sweating profusely trying to answer this and he came up with this. Um, I think it's going to be you know housewives storing their recipes on computers <laughs> and that's why we're going to need lots of computers. Right. Right? Um, I, I, I think I think the, the the broad understanding of what is possible, how quickly it is possible, and what price point it is possible, is much much quicker changing than the world is aware of it. Mm -hmm. We basically always have the conversation that goes around something like this: um, uh, "Dear Mrs. Customer, you know." Tell us a little bit of what is bugging you. Oh, you know, I have this and this problem. So it's like, oh, you know, we can give you a satellite solution for that that solves this problem this and this way. And the answer is like, really? Mm. Like it is never, uh, I don't need that. Mm -hmm. It is virtually exclusively, wow, I didn't know it exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that is that is kind of like where, where we as an industry um, uh, uh, have like the, the tremendous opportunity of just making more and more of planet Earth available, uh, uh, aware of the solutions that can be uh, found by leveraging space to solve problems right here on Earth. So, so let me ask you, and I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, how can we be, as a sector, how can we be better at that? And are there maybe lessons from the analogy you're using you know, from the computer industry that we can use here? Because I mean, you know, if, if I was to be facetious, um, the sad reality is that very often these days one gets confronted with people thinking that well, space is a playground for billionaires. <laughs> and you may have seen the Matthew McConaughey Super Bowl ad and all of that. And uh, how can we be better at communicating that and educate, educating people? I, I, think, I think we just have to be realistic. I actually don't think that uh, the communication is bad. I think we're actually in a much better position than the internet was because space is ultimately far more inspiring and interesting than, you know, digits were. And so I think we're actually in a good position. We just also have to be realistic relative up to of our size, right? If the, if the global economy is, what, $80 trillion and the space economy today is half a trillion dollars, we are actually more part of the public psyche than that GDP percentage would actually call for. Mm. So I think we're actually doing okay. It's just we have to be more patient. We just have to stick with it. We don't have to expect that people immediately understand it. I think we have to tone down the geek factor mm -hmm. and, 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 and tune up the, the relevance factor. You know, in mm -hmm. software, there's this, mm -hmm. great, this great talk of never talk um, about features, only talk about benefits. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one thing where I feel that um, the internet did a better job in, in, in driving towards the, the, the benefits and maybe not so much about the geek side. I mean, they had that as well, but that's like one thing that I see a lot. But overall, I would say it's just patience. It's just patience and being humble to recognize where we are in the cycle and, and where we are in terms of importance right now relative to everything else that is going on in the world, but also recognizing that the exponential scale that is happening here is rapidly changing that. Yeah, I think you bring up an important point there, which is that at the end of the day, the customer, we should be customer centric, right? And like you say, like try to understand what, what are really the problems that are bugging them and how can we help solve them? At the end of the day, I guess they may think space is cool, but they don't really care that the solution is coming from space. Absolutely. Right? If, if anything, it, I could even see it intimidating some customers in like a space that's very complicated, it's probably too expensive and, and, and all of that. Now, how much of a constraint? So let me talk about my experience day to day as a space venture capitalist. So we would love to find more, and, and by the way, this is a call to arms to some of, uh, of the potential entrepreneurs among our listeners. We would love to find more companies that can help provide really value-added products to certain non-space sectors on Earth using space data as a solution. You know, it could be insurance, it could be mining, it could be uh, agriculture, whatever. One constraint that I'm seeing day to day still is that the space sector is still very closed in on itself and almost 100% of the business plans I'm getting 
including for these types of businesses where somebody, for example, is proposing to uh, you know, do EO uh, data analysis for insurance, the founders are basically from the space industry. And it seems like we haven't really drawn in enough people from other sectors to gain their expertise as well. Is that something you're also seeing? And how are you kind of dealing with that in your job. I, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not an investor, so I, I have um, uh, in the space sector. Uh, but yeah, you know, when I look around, it is uh, uh, the majority of people are coming uh, from the engineering side. I think this made it a little bit um, un unusual for Spire um, and beneficial for us that I had a, a very very strong business financial mm -hmm. numbers um, career. Um, uh, before before we uh, engaged into uh, in, into the industry, and that is, you know, you earlier asked how did we find the business model? Um, because we started with what are sustainable competitive advantages of the industry. Like we set out to say, okay, this data from space, it's data that um, uh, can only and exclusively be captured from space, and it is data from sensors that can be software defined. Mm -hmm. So we had those criteria that are driven by business rationale and and Porter's five forces and other kind of like um, environments. And then we looked at those and it's like, okay, what type of data does it mean? What type of technology does that mean? Mm -hmm. So we started with those business criteria mm -hmm. and then worked our way to technology, which then became, you know, you use, you know, software defined radios, mm -hmm. um, RF observation, very, very high asset utilization and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think, I think it's just natural when you have a new technology that you have um, a lot of, uh, of technologists that enter mm -hmm. it as entrepreneurs. But even there, I see it actually changing, Rafael. Um, I see more and more people bringing in into the founding group uh, 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 co-founders that have more business experience, more marketing experience. Mm -hmm. Again, I think, I think it's a matter of time that we'll have more and more of that. The same way as even today, when you look in Silicon Valley, um, uh, startups in the software as a service business they generally have a pretty strong technology bend, mm -hmm. um, but they now often bring, you know, a sales or a marketing person mm -hmm. as a founding team member as well. Um, that probably wasn't really the case 20 years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. No, I, I would definitely agree to that. Okay, um, I want to finish off our discussion of, we've been, discuss we've been talking a lot about uh, remote sensing, and I want to come uh, come on and talk um, about space as a service in a, in a moment but i want to ask you just sort of almost in a in a in rapid fire way about a few potential uh, trends in in eo that might be interesting uh, just to hear your, your view one of them is that we are having more and more satellites up there um, due to the trends that we've mentioned and they're producing more and more data is there something like a data bottleneck um, and how can we deal with that so i think space is going through like the same thing as you have on the internet of things on earth um so for example spire launched uh, it's now a few years ago already two supercomputers into orbit and we're talking teraflops of compute power okay um, to do what's called computing at the edge mm -hmm. where you take massive amounts of data and you crunch it in situ, so like in the location where the data is collected mm -hmm. and extract the, the valuable bits mm -hmm. right there and you ship it away. It's almost like if you had um, a, a diamond mine that is taking the diamonds out of the material right on location mm -hmm. so that you don't have to transport all of the rock and just mm -hmm. the diamonds is what you transport away because you have a similar kind of like transportation problem. So I do see that happening. I mean, we have done it. I think other people are thinking about it or have started to do something similar. And I think it's going to continue. Okay, that, 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 makes, that makes a lot of sense. And then another thing that we've seen a few times now, um, but I don't think it has been done really in commercial reality is people talking about going to what's called uh, VLE or very low Earth orbits, which I guess could provide you with things like a you know, even better spatial resolution. Any thoughts on that? So yeah, people have have looked at it. People have um, you know def definitely experimented with it. Um, it's a it's a it's a trade off between the extra amount of fuel that you have to bring, mm -hmm. the extra thermal isol isolation you have to bring, and the uh, uh, the resolution that you get. Mm -hmm. Now for um, uh, for opticals. Um, you double the resolution when you half 
um, your, your distance. But for RF sensing, you quadruple it. Okay. So there definitely are benefits for being closer rather than further away. How that will be exactly used, how that trade-off um, uh, between fuel and thermal isolation and the increased cost and mass and size versus the value of the increased resolution, you know, I think that will depend on every single business case. But I could totally imagine business cases where there is the right trade-off to be made to not be in, you know, um, uh, 800 kilometers, but mm -hmm. to be in, you know, 300 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Your constellation, what's the altitude of your constellation? Our ideal altitude is about 500 kilometers. Gotcha. And actually brings me on to my next, um, my next question. And you guys, I don't think you guys have onboard propulsion, or do you? Uh, we do. You do have one. Oh, okay. In some instances we do, and in some instances we don't. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you about you know space debris and space traffic management. It's obviously a big topic as we are uh, putting more and more satellites um, into space. What What are your thoughts? What's your maybe your day to day experience with things like uh, yeah space traffic management? Do you have a lot of conjunction warnings? Do you guys have to yeah move around your satellites a lot? So I wish that the knowledge about um, uh, space traffic management would not be 90% derived from the movie Gravity. <laughs> um, I'm just, yes, space is a precious environment mm -hmm. and we absolutely have to protect it. Just like we have to protect, you know, in my mind, the ocean, earth, climate and air and all sorts of other environments. Um, uh, space is also incredibly vast. Mm -hmm. You know, to put that a little bit in perspective, um, the world's ocean cover only they actually cover less than three quarters of the world's surface area. Mm -hmm. And there are 300,000 massive ships operating on the ocean every single day mm -hmm. and millions of small vessels. This is just 75% of the surface area of that, the Earth. That, that, that's fair, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I think- And that's just, that's just for, the, yeah. for, the, for, for, your, for your listeners, yes. um, the total number of satellites that are in like this orbit between, you know, zero and call it 800 or 1,000 kilometers is a few thousand. Yeah, let me just push back on that. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of those ships carry transponders precisely in part to avoid collisions with other ships which is not currently the case with satellites, right? Well, satellites um, have emitting signals for themselves, right? Yeah. Um, and those transponders were introduced when the density of ships reached an amount where it made sense. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, are we at this density where it yeah. makes sense? Yeah. And I just wanted to point out yeah. that there is two orders of magnitude between ships and space. And then space is not just one layer, but it is thousands of layers. Cells, yeah, so cells. Mm -hmm. arguably, we are in terms of density, many, many orders of magnitude away from the density of ship traffic. Yes. Okay. That's this is this is a longer discussion. I mean, you could go into things like the carrying capacity for orbit and, and so forth, but we're not having a debris discussion, I suppose. I do want to switch over now to finally to talking about space as a service, right? And this is something that Spire is now offering. So I think when you guys started about almost 10 years ago, right? I mean, you're producing your satellites in-house. You did, I think you're doing your own ground, you're still having your own ground stations, right? So you basically did a very vertically integrated model, I assuming partly because there wasn't really um, much of a choice or this just- There was no was, choice. It was basically, yeah, it was the alternative you had to choose. Yeah. But again, kind of historical comparisons come back, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, at some point in time, there wasn't much um, of a choice if you wanted to have a computing architecture for your company, where these days you can just go to AWS or Azure or some other competitors and outsource everything. So it seems to me that you guys at Spire had basically your AWS moment where you realized well, we're really good at building and operating satellites. Why don't we offer this like AWS now also to third-party customers? That is 100% correct. Okay. Um, the same way as, as Amazon recognized that to run their business, they had to build a massive infrastructure, which I'm sure was a bit of a pain in the behind and incredibly complex because literally you had to deal with building permits and licenses and energy production and, 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 and HVAC systems and all everything else that had nothing to do with the business model side, but had to be solved first before you could run your business. Mm -hmm. But once they had solved it and they run this large infrastructure on it, they said, why don't we avoid for other companies 
having to do the same thing mm -hmm. and we just let them rent it. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, invented, you know, true space as a service a few years ago. Um, I truly believe we were uh, uh, the first one to really talk about it um, as a concept. Mm -hmm. And we're the only one which is really offering this soup to nuts service. We do tens of thousands of contacts a month. We process and ship to customers terabytes of data. Mm -hmm. We run the largest listening constellation in the world. So we just let other people like, hey, you know, we get now close to 400 years of space heritage and experience in doing all this at a large scale mm -hmm. for some of the single most demanding customers in the world. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you just rent it? Mm -hmm. And you focus on your business. Mm -hmm. And that has been an incredibly gratifying offering because we now can talk with entrepreneurs which start with a business problem. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Aurora Tech. Mm -hmm. There are wildfires. Mm -hmm. That's a business problem. Yeah. And they understand what data they need to solve it. Yeah. And they build a sensor and they build yeah. a software and everything, right? And then they recognize it's like, now I need to do this whole huge rigmarole of figuring out how to get in space and launch and licenses and ground stations and satellites and pointing and and um, uh, uh, and all this other kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And we just say, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. All of that complexity, we just take away and we give you an API. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that really enables entrepreneurs to focus on the business. It means investors can focus on the business. And the same way as no investor today needs to focus anymore on like, well, do you know how to build a data center? What's your experience in, you know, navigating zoning laws? And what's your experience in, they don't need to do this anymore. They did in the 80s and 90s, not today yep. anymore. And the same thing is true for customers um, uh, that work with us and their investors, all of the complexity of space, Spire has figured it out. It is running it 24 seven. You can just rent it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, which also means, by the way, you're moving from CapEx to OpEx. Right? It's a multi-subscription. You're 100% correct. It's a multi-subscription. You have great certainty of like, when you will have something to demonstrate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you don't have to wait. You don't have like this, all this uncertainty about it. Um, you have great certainty when you can start and you can match your cost with your revenue because it is a monthly subscription and you don't have to plunk down um, a, a wheelbarrow full of cash at the beginning and then wait a sometimes not very clearly defined amount of time until you have something to show. You just pay a, a, a reasonable monthly number that you can match with the revenue that you can hope to generate from your business model. Okay, let's just go slightly more into detail because there are so many um, parts basically that you're taking off the hands of the entrepreneurs that I think it's worth mentioning them. So basically, let's say an entrepreneur comes up with some you know interesting use case, like some of the use cases we described, you know, you found some solution, some sensor, which basically the data would serve a you know, a significant target market on earth. So entrepreneur has the sensor, has an idea about the business model, the target market, the go-to market and all of that. Um, they come to Spire. So first of all, are you using the same, is it the Lemurs, the Lemur platform as mm -hmm. well? You're using, so, so uh, remember, this is 3U? Three, three yeah, with 3U and 6U, and we have larger platforms as well that all are like, basically just a, a pumped up lemur. It's yeah. the same platform. It's the same technology. It's the same everything. It's the same heritage. Okay. Um, so as long as the, whatever the um, the payload is, the entrepreneur, that where really the, the core value of the entrepreneurs likes, as long as that payload fits the sort of, you know, size, weight, and I guess power requirements, we're fine, right? I guess those are yeah. the, main, the main constraints. And then if I was to come to you today, you know, with, with some payload and some idea and something that does fit in a Lemur, I mean, what kind of, and let's say I wanted to do a demo, like an IOD and a mm -hmm. demo mission, right? Maybe with one or two satellites to start with. Roughly speaking, what kind of, you know, cost and Time frame are we talking about? Ever so? Yeah, it, it now it now really depends yeah. on, uh, on 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 what are the uh, 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 the requirements that you have. You know, how big is your payload? Like, I mean, is yeah. it a payload which needs you know one watt, or is it a payload that needs fifty watts? Yeah. Right. So there is there is there is very very large variability sure. there. But what is what is I think the more important point is that you come to us as a customer. We get you operational in orbit in between six and 12 months. Six to 12 months. Okay. That is the big portion. Because when you think about the cost for a startup, it is, yes, I have to purchase something. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I have running costs, my people, mm -hmm. my office, you know, my payroll, all of that. And every single month delay 
that I have to wait longer to have something operational is a huge cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is the huge driver. Mm -hmm. We take often 12, 13, 14 months of running the company cost mm -hmm. out of a business model mm -hmm. by giving customers the certainty and speed of being operational within six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. So I mean, and everything that's obviously sort of implicitly involved there in the middle, which is getting the launch, right? And then the licensees, um, all of that, obviously you are taking off the entrepreneurs. Yes, everything. Yeah. But how about the uh, spectrum? How does that work? Human spectrum. So if you need to transmit something, then this is a spectrum that you have to get. Okay. I mean, we can sometimes help you, mm -hmm. right? And we have, you know, help customers there because again, you know, we have, you know, licenses in three jurisdictions. We have good relationships with people. We are very, very um, uh, uh, responsible and, and cooperative operators and, 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 and known for that. But generally, if you have to transmit something, that is the license that you get. If you receive something, that generally is very, very easy. Um, um, and for, for all of the other, we actually have and hold the licenses for that is necessary for a large number, not, not like everyone, but the vast majority of our customers. We hold all the licenses as well for them to do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Understood. And you made it sound like it's basically, um, in the end, like a subscription product. Yeah. Is that actually what it is? Is it like, should be imagined as a, as a monthly payment? Yeah. Or is there sort of like an initial payment? No, for the, no. It is a monthly payment. It's, it's, it's a monthly payment. What happens when the, um, uh, I'm going to assume that the lifetime of, of a Limur, like many lower of orbit satellites, is probably like something like five to seven years. Um, what happens once the, the lifetime of the satellite is up? Oh, so you, you, you sign a contract for a certain minimum duration. Mm -hmm. Right. Generally, that is, um, I think for us, it is, uh, it is two to three years. Um, you can then extend. Mm -hmm. um, if you then want to extend beyond the, um, uh, the lifetime of one satellite, we take care of that for you. You just have to give us another payload. Oh, but you just keep, keep paying the monthly fee. Yeah. So just, again, there's no yeah. sort of upfront or renewal no. fee or no. anything. No. Anything like that. Very interesting. Besides the, um, the, the the spectrum and the need to get spectrum if one needs that, is there anything else that's sort of left that the entrepreneur has to do other than the payload? They should be able to work with an API. Okay. And I'm saying this, you know, um, with, with a big grin on my face because, you know, uh, my eight-year-old daughter is just about able to speak with an API in Python, right? So that literally is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, now, there are specific um, business cases where you want to transmit something from a particular country, um, uh, and then you need a, you know, a, a license to do that transmission. Let's say you, know, you want to transmit some, uh, some data out of a country. Well, that's, that's a ground-based operation, and you need some license for that, mm -hmm. if that's your business model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but from the, from the space side element, literally, you get an API. Understood. So it's really just, just, just like like how you would work with Amazon AWS. Okay. So you're really taking 95% plus of the work basically out of the entrepreneur's Absolutely. Entrepreneur's hand. Well, I think that the entrepreneur, she has enough work with making the business work. Mm -hmm. Like that is that is that is hard enough. Mm -hmm. But the reason why we have this massive explosion of leveraging the internet mm -hmm. is because the vast majority of money doesn't go into building data centers anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not that every startup that comes out of, you know, Y Combinator is going out there and says like, okay, well, you know, Mr. VC, please give me $10 million and then hands it over to Cisco and says, here is $9.5 million, please build me a data center, yeah. right? They take the $10 million and say like, you know, here Amazon, here's like, you know, 50 grand, you know, get me going. And then they spend the money on product development, on marketing, on hiring, on people, because they don't have to do this massive upfront investment anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we believe that... Um, our model, and I'm, I'm sure that other companies that can develop the same scale as we do, that can truly be an Amazon, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, um, will enable the growth at, at, this, at this high pace that we're seeing because new companies don't have to build data centers anymore. Yeah, and I must say, speaking again from a perspective as a venture capitalist, I really hope that future space entrepreneurs get that into their head because we're still seeing actually these days quite a few business plans where people just say, oh, we're going to build our satellite in-house. And I think it's just becoming harder and harder to justify unless you have a really specialized need. It is incredibly hard to justify um, because there is 
so much similarity um, that is between two satellites. If you think about two satellites that are vastly different in their use cases, mm -hmm. right? 90% of the stuff is the same. Yeah. They all have batteries. They all have onboard computers. They all have radios for downlink. They all have solar panels. They all have data distribution systems. They all have um, uh, um, uh, uh, EPS systems. They all have power distribution systems. They, they, all of those systems are the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The mass of a satellite is mostly not the payload, but the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So it really makes no sense. And then you have all the complexity of launch. You have all the complexity of ground station. Mm -hmm. You have all the complexity of operating those satellites. Yeah. It really makes no sense that everyone does does 90% over and over and over and over again. We yeah. would not have as vibrant a software industry if everyone were to rebuild the data center from the ground up. Because trust me, the data center on the quotation marks that we built you know, 10 years ago is a joke compared to the one that we run mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. You do learn something when you do it mm -hmm. hundreds of times thousands of times you absolutely get massively better in doing it oh totally agree and you know that actually brings me to the next question i was going to ask but i was going to ask about reliability because some people might be worried okay well i'm going to be totally dependent on spire what if there you know something goes wrong and then my basically my business goes down but I guess the response would be, well, wouldn't you rather rely on somebody who has done this, uh, I think the equivalent of hundreds of years in space than trying to, like, where's the risk greater, right? Even more so. It's not just that I've done it or like, you know, I mean, personally, but, um, uh, you know, we as a company have done it for hundreds of years. It is my livelihood mm. depends on it. Yeah. Like if my infrastructure doesn't work, I'm dead in the water. Mm -hmm. And I love you, Mrs. Customer, but my own business is just still a little bit closer to me. So you can be damn sure that I make sure my infrastructure works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, my infrastructure is still the same starting point of my business as it is for you. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that um, we have done it hundreds of years and we have done it thousands and tens of thousands of times, our life depends on it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is like the, the powerful story of A Amazon AWS as well, is that that infrastructure is used by the big trillion dollar Amazon industry, and it is used to be rented by customers. It is the same infrastructure. Yeah, Everyone sits in the same boat. Yeah, and we're staying with the Amazon comparison. So, I mean, that's the question these days. Is Amazon more of a cloud computing company? Is it more of an e-commerce company? Is it both? I mean, if you look at sort of your, you know, I don't know, long-term vision for Spire, because of course we shouldn't discuss anything short-term here. It's a publicly quoted company. But in the long-term vision, I mean, where, what would you like Spire to be? So for us, the driving force was always, you know, to create, um, uh, to leverage space to solve problems on Earth. Mm. And, and one of the, the big generational challenges that, that I see, that we see, is, is climate change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that has always been driving us. And so um, if we can help humanity adapt to climate change, you know, make weather substantially more predictable, I have set this um, um, visionary, aspirational goal of mm -hmm. making weather prediction as accurate as Swiss train schedules. Yeah. Uh, that, that is really a, a driving force for us, yeah. um, uh, I would say. Okay, understood. Let me take a step back and sort of, um, I want to ask you one question, which is, so you have had this experience of you know, founding a major, what became a major space company almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I think, or at least I hope there are a lot of listeners who are considering becoming space founders. A lot has happened in space, right, in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, be it's become much more mainstream. People like SpaceX have become a really reliable launch provider. There are now other alternative non-government launch providers. Starship seems to be on the horizon. There seems to be much more capital available that's ready to be invested in space. If you were founded today, you know, how, how would you look at the industry differently and what would be, I don't know, some, some lessons or thoughts for today's founders? Well, I think, I think the first thing that would happen is if today someone tells their friends that, I'm, that they're leaving their job and starting a space company, um, uh, it's more likely that the friend says, can I join you? Rather than you're but, totally nuts. <laughs> which is what happened to me. You know, I, you know, a friend of mine was sitting me down, you know, and says like, you know, I'm, I'm a little worried about you, Peter, right? And he was sincere yeah. that there was a worry that I was leaving a, 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 a good career to do something in space. Um, I don't think this would happen today anymore. Yeah. Um, and that then translates into um, that there are people like you today that I wish 
you would have been around 10 years. Um, people that want to invest in space and that recognize that here is a disruption happening that is very, very akin to the disruption that happened from mainframe to personal computers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that there is a, a, a enormous amount of transformational value to be created and captured and supported. Mm -hmm. um, that was not necessarily the case 10 years ago. Um, uh, I, I recently read a statistics that the, uh, uh, that the number of students that want to, stop, want to um, study aerospace engineering has like gone up 50% or 60%, like an insane number. Mm -hmm. So the number of people that want to go in the field is dramatically larger, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, uh, those are just some of the things that, that have changed. What hasn't changed is, is still the same. It's like, you know, if you can solve a real world problem um, and space is the best way of doing it, then you have a business. Um, if space is just the second best way of doing it, and you have at least you have a very, very tough situation, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fully, fully agree. So where would that leave us if I asked you the following question? So if you were to start a new space company today, what would be... I don't know, what may be some fields you may be focusing on, some business models or subsectors, where you want to call it, some activities? I, you know what? My brain just froze by the thought of having to start another <laughs> Again. company, let the go, <laughs> another space company. And um, I have to say, my heart is a little bit taken. Mm. You know, really helping humanity adapt to climate change, whether it's like found everywhere. Mm -hmm. It is so often still, you know, the butt end of the joke, you know, we can't predict the weather. And I don't think it has to be. Mm -hmm. I think the lack is uh, uh, is in, in we don't have enough data. Um, uh, we have more and more analytic schemes that can be you know uh, well deployed there. Uh, so there is it shouldn't be. And I think we can we can be a contributor to making a difference there. Uh, I mean today um, there's over a billion people that have better weather prediction because of our data, mm -hmm. and that's a great start. I would just like it to be eight billion. Mm -hmm. Understood. No, that's that, that, that's very fair, and I fully agree with you, obviously, on the potential and importance of, of using space for monitoring and mitigating climate change. I think that should be really one of our the, the key contributions of the sector. Let me ask you the final question I always ask, which is about science fiction. So if we if we survive climate change and all of that, if we have a science fiction future, what are some of your potential inspirations or things you like from Science fiction, and it could be movies, uh, TV, books, whatever. Oh, science fiction. So, so not okay. Um, uh, so, I just literally here, um, uh, um, uh, 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 recently finished uh, a follow on book from the guy who wrote The Martian, Andy Weir. Um, uh, it was called The Hail Mary uh, Project. And I thoroughly oh, yeah, yeah. enjoyed that as well. It has the same witty, funny um, uh, style. It is it is quite scientific in its yeah. writing. So I I really really enjoyed that one. Speaking of climate change, did you have a chance to read uh, Kim Stanley Robertson yet? The Ministry of the Future, Ministry for the Future, I think it is. Uh, no, I have not. That that's that's actually an interesting one. So I'll, I'll leave you with that recommendation. Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really looking forward to see what uh, what Spy will continue to do for the space sector and for the world at large. And and yeah, best of luck with everything. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure to be here. And uh, um, uh, hopefully there were some good nuggets for for for, for you and then and, and your and your valuable uh, listeners. Well, that's it for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider giving it a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Also consider supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. If the podcast got you interested in learning more about the business opportunities in the space economy, check out my new online course on space entrepreneurship on udemy.com. The link is in the episode description. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself if you have an exciting space story to tell or interested in being a sponsor, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. I look forward to seeing you for the next episode.